Hi, my name is Tom Rice Oxley. So one of the most effective methods I find to build compositional technique is to take a piece by one of the greats, analyze it, and then write my own pastiche based on that as a model. It's not about trying to sound exactly like Mozart or Chopin or whoever it might be. It's a hands-on practical approach to building our compositional vocabulary so that we can then apply those techniques to our own musical style. So in this video we're going to follow the process through from blank page to finished piece and the work we're going to use as our model is the first gavotte from Bach's French Overture BWV 831. Step one is to analyze the overall form. A gavotte is a form of dance, and like most Baroque dances, it's typically in two parts, part one, part two, each of which repeats. This is usually referred to as binary form. Notice also that part one is a single musical sentence of eight bars, whereas part two is more extended, which is quite common in binary form generally. Another characteristic of form in a gavotte is that the phrases start on the upbeats. Remember that we're in 2-2 here. This is because of the characteristic rhythm of a gavotte dance. We're now in a position where we can set up our own Sibelius document. And as you can see, I've set it up with the same structure. Eight bars repeat, and then 16 bars repeat. With half bars at the beginning and ends of the section, so that the phrases can begin on the upbeat in true gavotte style. Steps two and three kind of happen together because they're achieved by the same means, namely by marking the cadences. And the cadences will then give you the phrase structure and the overall harmonic framework. So this first part starts in B minor and modulates to a full close in the relative major, which in this case is D. This is an extremely common modulation, which Bach affects by taking the leading note of B minor, A sharp, the one note that B minor and D major do not have in common, and flattening it to A natural. This section is repeated, and then in part two, we travel through a variety of different keys before returning to B minor again at the end. So we have our harmonic framework, but we also now have a clear idea of the phrase structure because as we said before, the cadences, as well as being harmonic points of arrival, also mark the borders of the phrases. If we look at the first two phrases, for example, the important cadences are the ones at the end of each phrase. These are the ones that indicate to our ears that the phrase has come to an end. And we often, not always, but it is fairly common in dance movements, we often get mini cadences marking a moment of rest in the middle of a phrase. So the first part consists of two phrases that make up a single musical sentence. By the way, I'm using the term sentence in a generic sense. Some people like to distinguish between sentences, periods, double periods, compound sentences, etc. Which is fine if you find it useful, but personally I find it can often serve to confuse rather than clarify. So part one consists of two phrases forming a single musical sentence. Part two, on the other hand, has four phrases paired in the same way so that we have two musical sentences. So if we now come to our composition, we're going to follow pretty much the same structure, the same phrase rhythm, the same key scheme, and the same end of phrase cadences. The only thing I've left open is these less important mini cadences, just to give us a bit of flexibility so that we can follow the route the musical ideas want to take us on when we come to write the piece. At this point we have the larger form, so binary, we have the key scheme, and we also have the phrase rhythm. In a moment we're going to go a level deeper and look at how Bach has constructed this piece motivically. What we'll find is that he's built the entire work from just the first two bars. So before we look at that, 
we're going to go to Logic Pro or Sibelius or the piano or however you compose and come up with two bars that we can then use as the basis for our own pastiche. And this is what I came up with. As you can see, it has that characteristic gavotte rhythm. We have a simple harmonic underpinning using basic chords diatonic to B minor. And we have a mini cadence, which in this case is a half cadence rather than the deceptive cadence Bach uses. The good news is that coming up with this initial idea is actually half the battle. Once we have this, we have something to work with, something that we can mold and shape into our composition, which brings us to the next step, which is subphrase structure. Each phrase is made up of two figures. For example, figure A, followed by a variant of itself, makes up the first phrase. The second phrase starts with a repetition of figure A, which is then answered by a different figure, B. And together we have the complete musical sentence. If we look at the whole composition, the entire work is made up of three figures in total. A occurs the most frequently at six times. Notice how it starts the final phrase just as it starts the first phrase, thereby giving a sense of homecoming and recapitulation at the end. Variants of figure B occur five times, and then we just have one occurrence of this figure, which we'll call C. So now in step five, this is the time to look at the harmonic progressions. We're using Roman numerals because it's the system that's most widely known these days, uh, but I actually don't like it very much, to be honest, especially when it comes to Bach, who didn't think in these terms. But that's a subject for another video. I think for the purposes of our pastiche, this analysis makes the main harmonic lessons pretty clear. Firstly, Bach sticks very much to chords diatonic to the key he is in at any given time. There's very little in the way of chromatic harmony, secondary dominance, etc. Secondly, his progressions are strongly tonal rather than modal, meaning that he avoids root movements up a third or down a second and favoring down a fifth and upper second progressions. And lastly, he uses inversions liberally to ensure that there is an active and melodically interesting bass line. Motivic analysis. So we've looked at the phrases, we've looked at the subphrases. The final level that we're going to be looking at is the level of the motif. And for me, this is where Bach's genius really comes to the fore. Because as we said before, this entire composition is built from just the first two bars, and the way that Bach weaves his tapestry from such slender beginnings is truly extraordinary. The figure consists of two motifs. First we have this crotchet, quaver, quaver, crotchet idea, which is essentially an elaboration of this chord using what are often called changing notes, notes that surround the tone they're approaching on both sides. The second motif rounds off the figure and takes it into the mini cadence. It consists of a crotchet followed by a scalar descent, and then this appoggiatura, which in practice, as the dotted lines show, is actually two crotchets a step apart. Even at a casual glance, variants of these motifs jump out from the page. But a more than casual glance reveals that the fabric of this movement is even more tightly woven from these motifs. These changing notes, for instance, Bach immediately repeats them in the bass, but this time augmented, increased in length. The same thing happens here, and here, and here, upper fifth, and here, upper step, more subtly here, which is also inverted upside down as well as augmented. The changing notes are repeated explicitly as we near the cadence at the end of the first part, sequenced down a step, and then sequenced down again, but this time augmented. Finally, to my ears, the stepwise double crotchet appoggiatura of the mini cadence is recalled at the closing cadence, approached by its straight inverted form and its augmented inversion, accompanied by itself above. I'd invite you to apply this process to the rest of the piece. You'll find that there's barely a note that isn't in some way derived from the two motifs that make up that opening figure. To be clear, this is not unique to this piece. You can take pretty much any work by Bach and you'll find the same rigor of motivic integration and musical logic. And this is not Bach playing an academic game, by the way. It sounds academic when we talk about it, but not when we listen to it.
because our ear, which reflexively looks for patterns, always has something else to discern in the music, always has something else to discover, even if we cannot consciously articulate what it is the ear is connecting with. There's a reason we keep coming back to Bach. He's like a dressmaker weaving a tightly spun fabric that's built to last, and this is one of the reasons why it has lasted. So with this in mind, let's go back to our own composition and build it in a similar fashion. So this was our original structure, and this was our initial idea. This opening figure has two principal motifs, a leap of a fourth that leaps down again to a quaver turn-like structure, and a straightforward rising scale. In the bass here, we have a pretty explicit inverted echo of this part of the blue motif. And in fact, in terms of pitch, although the quality of the intervals is not the same because we're staying diatonic to the key, the whole quaver sub-motif could be said to be present in retrograde inversion, although I'm not sure how strongly the ear picks that up, to be honest. Likewise, this initial leap is echoed in inverted augmentation, that is, expanded from a fourth to a sixth and going down instead of up. Now we need to answer this idea. So we're going to take those same motivic elements and build a response that leads in naturally to that imperfect, authentic cadence that ends the first phrase. And this is what I ended up with. Um, like Bach, we start with a clear echo of the first motif, a leap followed by a four quaver pattern. And then we have this near repetition of the second part of the same motif. In terms of the bass, there isn't really much in the way of motivic integration except for the leap from F sharp to B here. Because it occurs at an important structural point at the end of the phrase, the ear detects a pleasing symmetry, I think, with the same leap that opened the phrase. And this idea that's going to link us to the next phrase is, of course, a literal diminution, a halving of the note values of the four quaver submotif. So our second phrase now has to modulate to D major and lead to a perfect authentic cadence in D major. We start by taking the upper part of our opening figure and repeating more or less exactly. Again, this is the same thing that Bach did, if you remember. But although we're repeating the melody, we change the underlying harmony. Like Bach, we accomplish the modulation by shifting the A sharp to A natural. Notice that we've also imitated the way Bach has dropped to the A natural from the B above. This creates a smooth effect, because our ear, which at this point is attuned to B minor, hears it initially as a descending melodic minor scale motion in B minor, before this mini cadence to D major, from A, the dominant of D, pivots the ear into the new key, an impression that's consolidated by this similar leading note chord to tonic motion here. Bart kept things moving at this point to avoid too much squareness, and I wanted to do the same. So we hear this mini cadence very much in passing due to the fact that the dominant is in first inversion. The third of the tonic is in the treble rather than the tonic note itself, and the scale idea continues upwards without interruption. That scale is of course built from the second sub-motif up a fourth, and is accompanied by a similar scale below. We have an inverted version of the quaver motif, with the same pitches then repeated in the bass and accompanied by a fragment above. Incidentally, if you've studied counterpoint, you'll notice that there's a diminished fifth followed by a perfect fifth here. That works fine when the lower note moves up by a semitone as it does here. But these parallel perfect fifths, on the other hand, a music teacher would probably feel obliged to mark down if we were doing an exam. But the independence of the voices is clear and I like the sound in this context. So putting it all together, it sounds like this. As we planned, the second part is twice as long, with two sentences rather than just the one that we had in the first part, each sentence consisting of two phrases. We have the end of phrase cadences that we planned. This first mini cadence, a half cadence in A, I stole directly from Bach. 
I really like how this D, the root of the D major, becomes the seventh of the E7 chord, the dominant of A, which our ear is waiting to resolve traditionally onto the C sharp of A major. But Bach takes our ear on a journey up to the E, back down to the D, which then finally resolves as we expect on the C sharp on the strong beat of the following bar. The modulation to A takes place by introducing the one note that D and A do not have in common, namely G sharp. Our mini cadences are not exactly the same as Bach's, but they stay pretty close. In particular, I stole this scalar descent to the D sharp, the foreign note that pivots us into the new transitional key of E minor. Stepwise movement is very powerful to the ear and therefore an effective way to make rapid modulation sound smooth, as anyone who knows Jacob Collier's music can tell you. Some might take issue with the uh, consecutive fifths by contrary motion here between the outer parts, but because they occur at a phrase boundary, our ear just senses one thing ending and another beginning rather than a jarring progression between chords. Likewise, the augmented second in the treble between the G natural and A sharp works because we hear the melody as this semitone rise, followed by the same interval sequenced up a major third, rather than as a continuous scale with an awkward augmented second in the middle. And finally, we have of course continued the use of subphrase figures and motivic integration that we began in the first part to give coherence and cohesion to the piece as a whole. So there we have it. We may not be able to write as well as Bach, but we can at least still learn from him. Um, hopefully we've developed our musical ear and our ability to analyse a piece of music. But most importantly, I think we've expanded our compositional toolbox, meaning that we have more options when we come to compose music in the future. So thank you very much for watching and we'll play out with Gavotte in B minor, not composed by Bach and very much not performed by Andras Schiff.